All right, good afternoon, everybody, and thank you for joining us today. Uh, my name is Andrew Dauphine, and I'm the Instruction and Outreach Librarian at the New Jersey State Library. Um, today's presenter is Casey Zahn, and she's going to be talking about searching for your Irish roots. So a little bit of Irish-centered genealogy for a lot of us who are working from home and being able to take advantage of the many resources that are available. Um, Ancestry Library Edition is available remotely through the New Jersey State Library at this time for authorized users, um, which includes state employees and members of the Thomas Edison State University community. Um, but there are also other, a lot of free uh, genealogical resources out there that you can utilize during this uh, time um, if you find that you have a little less to do and you're trying to fill your time at home. So, um, a few housekeeping items before we start the presentation. Um, there is a handout associated with this talk, so um, please find that under the handout section of the GoToWebinar dashboard. If you cannot find the dashboard, um, it's possible that it was collapsed, so look either at the top left or right corner of your screen for a small orange box with a white arrow. Um, if you click on that, that'll either expand or collapse the dashboard and then you'll be able to find all of the information there. Um, there will be a survey at the end of this webinar as well as in a follow-up email so if you could please complete that uh, we would greatly appreciate that. If you have any questions we will be answering them at the end of the presentation and there are a few ways that you will be able to ask questions. Um, you can ask them in the chat section, you can ask them in the question section of the dashboard, or you can email me directly and my email address is on the screen right now. Um, lastly, before we get started, um, as we are all adjusting to a work from home environment, um, I do have three wonderful dogs who love me to death. And while I will be muted for most of the time, um, when I pop on, you may hear them, but I will try to keep their activity to a minimum. So um, without any further ado, I'll present you to Casey and she can take it away. All right, thanks, Andrew. Let me get my screen up here. I just wanna welcome everybody and happy spring to you. Um, before I go on, I want to thank Andrew and the New Jersey State Library, and especially Virginia Fitzpatrick, for having me today. It's a delight to talk to you about Irish research. And even though I only have 45 minutes, there's so much I want to share with you. So I have to remember to keep my voice slow and to remember that I have to stay on target because if I don't, we're going to be here for four hours instead of 45 to the next hour. So as we begin, I, again, I want to welcome you and I hope you enjoy this beautiful sunny day and hopefully get you inspired about searching your Irish roots. Um, I just want to go over, give you an overview of what we're going to do today. We're going to talk about following an ancestor. In this case, I'm using one of mine. We're going to talk about creating a timeline. I'm a teacher, taught for 35 years. Timelines are great, especially when you're doing any type of historical research. Kind of keeps you on track and keeps you focused. Um, we're going to tra trace that one ancestor of mine through some U.S. sources, and we're going to track her through some online sources. And we're going to talk a little bit about visiting Ireland and what is next. Something really exciting is happening in Ireland that you need to know about, and it is quite exciting. So before we begin, I just want to remind you, create a timeline and don't forget to cite your sources. I'm a big fan of Elizabeth Shaw Mills and citing sources are so important and so key to any genealogical research. So make sure that you do cite your sources. So create a timeline. What you see in front of you, I did on a Microsoft Word document, three columns, name the date, the event and sources. I like to use this for when I go to the library as a general overview of what I have and what I don't have. But even when I start a genealogical project, I like to put in the name of the person at the top, what I know about when they were born, when they died, and list the events that I know of at that time. So you can see it's a very sketchy timeline right now, but as we go on and I talk about things, I can go back and always add to it. Um, Microsoft document allows you to insert another row into the document. If you don't want to use a Microsoft document and you're familiar with Excel, use Excel, whatever suits you best and what knocks your socks off. So here's Catherine Goodwin. Um, I start with her. 
um, I'm going to check for her death online. Um, of course, I'm going to go to the biggies, Ancestry.com and FamilySearch.org to look for at Rhode Island Records to see if I can find her death. It doesn't appear on Ancestry, but I can find it referenced on Family Search. I want to shout out to Find My Pass. Find My Pass is a UK, Ireland, Scotland, English um, database. If you're not familiar with them, they have records for Ireland um, on their database. They've got a great subscription, but what they've done is for the US, if they're starting to digitize a lot of the US Catholic Church records, I know they've done Philadelphia already, yay, uh, Baltimore, and they're working on New York and a few other locations that they're working on. So great to go back and check out Find My Pass if you haven't seen it. And they do have a monthly subscription, so if you just want to try it for a month, you know, you know, that's something that I tell people all the time, just try it for a month and see if you like it. Of course, there's the biggie, find my grave, and billions of graves. I'm going to look for her death, rec her death stone, her headstone on those databases. Um, I'm going to check newspapers. Um, Genealogy Bank is one of my favorites, as well as newspapers.com. But there are so many newspaper databases out there, and they're adding to it all the time. So a lot of good stuff out there. So we're going to begin by looking at Find My Grave Memorial for Catherine McCarran. And when we go to Find My Grave Memorial, we'll see her head still listed over here it gives an approximate date of her birth it gives her death date and where she's buried in rhode island i'm going to be talking a lot about rhode island resources um so you know forgive me if i don't mention much about new jersey but i will try to interject a lot of new jersey records into the um our conversation today but as we look and find my grave right here um you see catherine who we have her birth and death date someone whoever created this database gave us some more information of where they got her death record. And you can see it came from Family Search. It gives her death date, her location of her death, her birth date, and who she married, and her name of her parents. Great information on that database. So I'm gonna start that and put that in my timeline. Then I'm gonna expand my timeline by looking at newspaper articles. And fortunately for me, Pawtucket, Rhode Island does have their newspapers digitized and online. So for December 16th, the very next day after she died, I find her obituary. It gives me oodles of great information. For example, the name of her husband, Thomas McCarran, which we learned from Find a Grave, but where she had lived, what time she died, okay, um, not last night, and then what time um, her funeral will be on Monday. So if this is Saturday, Monday would be two days later on the 18th. It gives me a brief synopsis of Ireland. Now, this is where it gets frustrating, and I can hear you all shaking your head right now saying, yes, everything you look at says Ireland, Ireland, Ireland. And it doesn't say where in Ireland. That's all right. That's why I'm here today. I'm going to show you some of these good stuff. But it tells us she was born in Ireland to Patrick and Ellen Mc Conley Goodwin, and that she was 85 years, and she had been living in the city for 65 years. Good clue as to when she arrived in the country. Um, her children, two sons, four daughters, a number of grandchildren, and she even had grand, great grandchildren when she died in 1939. And my aunt told me this great story. She was five years old and she had been there when she had died with my, my grandmother and she had seen the back of my grandmother's, my great great grandmother's back. And she said that her rosary had been imprinted on the back of her because when she died, she had a rosary and they just kind of laid on the back and it formed a perfect heart. And that was something my aunt always remembered about that. But I always tell people, once you find the obituary, just don't stop there. Go a few days later, because in the time period from 1880 to about eh, 1960s, 1970s, some places even later, um, they gave not only information about the obituary, but they tell you about the funeral, the mortuary. Sometimes it's called a necrology, or sometimes they even call it in another obituary. But if we look a couple of days later on Monday in the afternoon, we have the funeral of her being held this morning from her house and then the mass at the church it lists the names of the priests so if you have a family member who's a priest or a nun they may pop up in this mortuary as well but the best part of all besides the organist and the soloist you have the names of the people who are the pallbearers great information because we have all these great names down here of men chances are they are family members so keep that in mind when you're looking at when you're looking at the obituary. So 
we're going to add to the timeline. We know her birth, we know her parents, we know her husband. We have the names of her children. We have where the mass, the burial, and so forth, and the names of the pallbearers. Now, hint, hint, I kind of bolded the, the names here because we're going to come back to them. And they carry a key in helping me finding where Catherine was in Ireland. The next part, what I do on my timeline is I look at census records. I'm going to get to the federal census records in just a second, but ask yourself, does your state have a state census that you can look at? Well, in Rhode Island, fortunately for me, yes. Connecticut, no. New York, yes. New Jersey, yes. Pennsylvania, no. But the places that do have a state census, you can find them online at familysearch.org or in Ancestry. Both of them have some type of state census for you to look at for those states. So take a look to see if your state that you're looking for has a state census. When you're doing a search on ancestry or family search, and I give a lot of genealogy classes and I see a lot of people who do this, they type up the information that they have. For example, they put Patrick Francis McCarran instead of just Patrick McCarran. They get caught up in putting the full name into the search box. So what I tell people to do is just keep it simple, keep it easy for yourself. Put in the first name, Patrick. Put in the last name, McCarran. Put in the location, city and state only. That's all you need on a lot of these databases because they'll do the searching for you. If you check on the exact matches, you're going to be missing some really cool information, or you may be missing the record because maybe Patrick was living in Pawtucket in 1939, but maybe in 1940, he's living across the border in Massachusetts or in the next town over in Providence. So keep that in mind. Don't check the exact matches. Keep it simple, first, last name, and location. You could always narrow it or add other information later on. So. Starting with the federal census, now we know that this year, hopefully everybody filled out their census form for the month. Um, we just did the 2020 census. And remember that the, the census are not available to the public for 72 years. So this census that we just took a couple of week, weeks ago, will that be available to the public to see for 72 years? I don't know about you, but I might be six feet under by that time. But however, in the United States, our most recent census is 1940. The 1950 census will be out in one year, 11 months, and 16 days. Yeah, you could tell I'm counting down for the census, for the release of the 1950 census. But until then, we're, we have to start with the 1940 census. Because she died in 1939, 1940 census may be helpful for me to find, track where her two children were at that time that she was living with. But I'm going to start with the 1930 census. And there's some funny things I'm going to tell you along the way here with the 1930 census. So oh, hopefully, hopefully it'll work. Let's come on, come on. But anyways, for the 1930 census, a lot of great information in this census. There we go. Okay, waiting for it to load up. Sorry about that. Maybe I close out some of these windows that may help me with this information. And I just closed out the New Jersey thing. Oh, well, we do that at the end. All right, so anyways, the 1930 census, come on, one of these days. Here we go. You find she's in 1930 census. She's all the way located at the bottom of the page. And why can't we go to the bottom of the page? Here we go. There she is. Ancestry highlights it for us. Let's zoom in a little bit. And we can see that when I did the search under Catherine, I would used a C. But in this case, she's written as a K. I love the census for the 1930 census because right next to it, you have this little R that tells you it's a, it tells you that she's renting and she pays $22 a month for rent. But if you notice her neighbor has a little R next to the, after the rent date, that's to tell you that he owns a radio. So she has access to a radio for her next door neighbor. Um, when you look at Catherine's information down here this is the great stuff right here that you really want to pay attention to besides her date and that she's a widow that she was born in ireland northern ireland northern ireland northern kind of a key to tell you that she was born in northern ireland now during this time of 1930 remember northern ireland was part of the english um, government so was she one of those six colonies on the top or was she one of those border country co counties up there if you look at her neighbor a couple of doors up, Mrs. Mary McIntyre, she was born in the Irish Free State, telling me that she was born in one of the 26 counties below Northern Ireland. 
So you've got to keep that in mind when you're looking at these records. And this is after that division between Northern and Southern Ireland, where Ireland wasn't one whole country, it was two parts. So keep that in mind when you're doing that. Being that she's at the bottom of the page, you want to check the next page. So if I turn the page and I look at the top, lo and behold, I have the names of the two children that are living with her. Isabel, a daughter, 48, and her son, Joseph P. Now, keep that in mind that in Catholic church records, a lot of children are named Joseph and they go by their middle name. So keep that in mind. It's very true of the French Canadians because I have a family of French Canadian Irish relatives from Canada and they're all listed Joseph, 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 and they all went by their middle name. But yet in some of the census records and city directories, they're all listed as Joseph Carroll. So keep that in mind when you're looking at that. So that's the 1930 census. We got some clues. 75 years old, she's living in Pawtucket. If we come back to here, let's look at the 1920 census to see if we can learn a little bit more. But they also can kind of give us a clue as to how long she was a widow and so forth. So here she is right in the middle of the page. Wait for it to load up. Let's zoom in a little bit here so we can see it. And here she is, Catherine, head of household, and she's still renting. Notice that we don't know how much she was paying rent, but look at this. This says that she was born in Rhode Island. What's up with that? It says that her parents were Ireland and English, Ireland and English. And notice that all of the Ireland records are Ireland and English, Ireland and English. Remember in 1922, you had that huge uprising in Ireland where not only was Ireland divided into two parts, but in 1922, you had the burning of the four courts and the big repository of all the records that were burnt there. And I'll talk about that during the thing. It's just quite sad. But again, this is a good clue to tell us that, okay, she's, she's living in Pawtucket. Now she was 75 in 1930. Look at this one. She's only 74, oh, that's giving me the wrong one here. She's 74. She only aged one year and 10 years. Isn't that great, ladies? Wouldn't you love to age one, one year and 10 years? That's great. But anyways, a clue to kind of tell you that, you know, she doesn't know her own age. And unfortunately in Ireland, they really didn't know exactly when they were born, but they had an idea. So that's the 1920 census. Now, if we continue on, let's go back to the 1910 census. The 1910 census gives us even more clues. So first thing I'm gonna do is see how old she is, but also to look at, is she listing Rhode Island or is she listing Ireland as her home place? So when we get the census on here, here she is right in the middle again. It's always great when they're found right in the middle. And if we look right over here, here she is. Now she's a widow, now she's 60. So. 10 years, she aged 14. This is up to me. I think I'd rather age one year instead of 14, but that's okay. So here she is listed as a widow. Okay, pay attention to where they're living. In this case, she's living on East Avenue. Now look at the children in her house. The last census we saw, Joseph P. This says Patrick J. Could that be the same person? Hint, hint, yes it is. But she has a son Thomas, a son Eugene, and then two daughters living here. If you look over here carefully, you see that she has eight children who were born and seven who are living. Kind of a clue that there are a couple children who are not living in the household in the 1910 census. So between 1910 and 1920, somebody got married. Now notice up here, it says she was Irish and it says English, but English is crossed out and says Irish. Okay, another clue to kind of point you to that Southern part of Ireland, all right? So kind of got a little bit of conflicting information. Is she from Northern Ireland? Is she from Southern Ireland? but even her parents are listed as Irish-Irish, Irish-Irish, meaning that probably they were from that Southern part of the county. Now, the last census says she arrived in 1870. This one says she arrived in 1872. So I wanna keep track of those dates because that's gonna help me to figure out when she arrived into this country. So pay attention to that. This is why the census records are so vital to help you search through everything. So we looked at the 1910, let's look at the 1900. And notice during this time period that Catherine's a widow for quite a long time, basically from at least 1910 to 19, almost 1940. If we look at the 1900 census, lo and behold, we find her living with her husband, Thomas. Now we learned that her husband's name was Thomas from this obituary, 
And sure enough, there he is. So we kind of have a clue as to when Thomas died between 1900 and 1910. And we want to go back and find out when he died. But what's great about this census, not only does it tell you how many children were born and how many children are living, but it also tells you how many years they've been married. So a good clue is to figuring out 1900 minus 25, 1875. Kind of interesting when you come over here and look at Catherine's arrival, now it says 1874. And she had been here for 26 years. So sometime after she arrived, she met Thomas, she got married and she started popping out those kids. If we count the children in this household, there's three, four, five, six, seven, matches the number over here. So there's a child, if you look at the dates of all the children and put them in chronological order, you'll find that they're between Thomas and I believe it's Isabel or Thomas and Eugene, there was another child who was born that probably died. So kind of a clue for me to go back and look at maybe a death record for that time period to see if that's information. So why am I spending all this time looking at census records? Well, because I want to fill in my timeline because it's important for me to get as much information about my Irish relatives as possible. So if I look at the timeline now and I add to it, I have her birth, I have her parents. Now I have the names of all of her children and when they were born. If you look over here, for example, Joseph Fields, her name is Catherine, she's born in 1879. But then over here, as I'm searching, I started searching on those pallbearers. And lo and behold, Beatrim is the grandson of Margaret and Catherine's nephew. John is the nephew of her husband, Thomas. It's his sister's son. William, who was a pallbearer in, in the funeral, is the nephew of Catherine's nephew through her sister, Maria. Here's another sister, Anne, and her son, Eugene, was a pallbearer. And the last two pallbearers were neighbors who lived near Catherine. So I'm finding out all these clues. I'm investigating all of these people. And why do I want to do that? Because you're going to find out why in just a second. If we go back and we know that she arrived in between 1870 and 1874, she should be in the 1880 census. So let's see if you're the super sleuth here and see if you can find what I found when I did this. I had a lovely friend named Audrey who told me, Casey, you've got to look at all the neighbors, a page before and a page behind. Best advice I ever heard from anybody who's doing research. So it's really a great clue. So here we go. Here's Thomas and Catherine. They're living in South Bend Street. Here's the house number. And you can see the top three children were born at this time. The rest of the children hadn't been born. Notice that Catherine was born in Ireland. He was born in Rhode Island and that his parents were born in, in Ireland. But if I look at the neighbors, look who's living at 79 South Bend Street, Ellen Goodwin. Hmm. I wonder who she is. Oh, look at this. There's Isabel and there's Annie. If I look at the neighbors on the other side, here's Bridget and here's Ellen. Catherine was living near her family after she arrived in 1874. So all big clues, pay attention to the neighbors because not only do we pick up her mom, which was a surprise to me that her mom was here. I was like, gosh, I have to go look for her record, find out when she arrived but her two sisters and her other two sisters. So remember, Irish travel together in groups. They live to near each other in groups and they work together. Pay attention to what their occupations are because that's also another big clue to help you out when you're researching Irish records. So if we come back to our timeline and we add to it, we can see that the family expands now. We have Ellen, now we have her sisters, including and as well as Catherine. And in doing the research, we discovered that Margaret had two daughters and six sons. Bridget had three daughters and one son. Ellen, two sons, a daughter, et cetera, et cetera. But Isabel doesn't marry. And that's a clue too, because if you have someone in the family who does not marry, she might hold a key to something. So after I do the census, my next step that I do is I fill in the information by look, going to city directories and finding them in city directories. Look at the city directories carefully, because in this 1903 directory, if you look carefully for Thomas, whoops, let me go back here. We find that Thomas died July 8th, 1903. Isn't that great information to find a death date in the city directory? Sometimes they'll tell you if they removed from the city, they'll have the letters R-E-M. Beach from Campbell removed from Pawtucket and ended up in Jersey City. So I went to the Jersey City directories. 
And a few years later, I find Beatrum Campbell removed to Pawtucket, Rhode Island. So pay attention to the city directories. They have these great little clues inside there. And pay attention to who's living with who because sometimes you can find where the family lived. In this case, they were living at 7th Arnold Street because here's Patrick J. Check the wills. As I said, Isabel was a great clue for me because when I found her will, I was doing the happy dance. But I did the happy dance even further because right in the middle of her will, it says, I direct my estate to reset the headstone now on the grave of my beloved parents in Mount St. Mary's Cemetery. Wait a second. That means Patrick came as well as Ellen to the United States. So now I have Patrick to look for. And sure enough, I went to the cemetery and took this picture of Patrick and Ellen. And there they are in Mount St. Mary's in Pawtucket. Now, cemetery records are great because sometimes the headstones will tell you where in Ireland they are. And some people get really lucky that way. Not so much me. I'm still looking where in Ireland they're from. So here's my next step. I went to the passenger records. This is the first page of the passenger ship of the Helka that arrived in Liverpool in 1972. And I love this record because I always like to show it in my class because the first name on this list, the first passenger listed, is a woman by the name of Fanny Dowd. She's 15. She's a spinster from England. If you go a couple lines down further, here's Isabel Goodwin. Nothing. She's nothing. She's from Ireland. Kind of gives you an idea of the separation of class. If you're from England, you were considered a spinster, no matter how old you were, or teenager you were. But if you're a 23-year-old unmarried woman from Ireland, you have no status. And over here, it tells you that they were in steerage. So here's Isabel, here's Annie. A few pages down, we come across Patrick arriving. He's a mechanic from Ireland. Ellen, and look who's with them, a six-year-old child by the name of Mary Campbell. She's actually the daughter of Margaret and Beatrim's sister. Beatrim the being the pallbearer in Catherine's funeral. So you can see we're starting to get the, even more information about family just by looking at passenger records. If you're fortunate enough to have family who arrived after 1900, you'll probably get a little bit more information. But from the time period of about eh, 1860 to about 1900, this is it. And again, just giving you this Ireland, it can be frustrating. So, what do you, so why did I talk about all of the family members because you want to think about 10 documents if you look at the first column birth bas baptismal marriage death and funeral home for example just looking for those those records and add a couple from the other side you should be able to find a record with the family members telling you where in ireland they're from so if you're not doing all of your family you gotta do all of your family back in the 90s when our genealogy group, the Central Jersey Genealogical Society, um, Genealogy Club, um, had a speaker from Ireland. I asked her the question. I said, I can't find where in Ireland they're from. And she goes, Casey, you've got to look at all of the members of your family. And she goes, you've got to also think if any of them were born in Ireland, because that's going to help you find the way back to Ireland. So think of all the members. So I made a list of Patrick and Ellen, their children, and the number of, you know, grandchildren. So you can think of not only Patrick and Ellen, the children, the grandchildren, sometimes even the great-grandchildren might give you a clue as to where in Ireland they're from. By doing this, this is about 42 people here, and I multiply it by 10. That's possible of 420 documents that you should be looking for for just a family. So keep that in mind when you're looking for your family. Check everybody. And like I say, cousins, second cousins, they may have the information that you're looking for. So keep that in mind. Another good book that's great for people to research here in the United States is this, it's an eight volume book called The Search for Missing Friends. A graduate student up in Boston, Massachusetts decided to go into the Boston newspapers. I believe it was the Boston Globe. I'm not 100 percent sure certain on that. But what she did is she went back to the historical newspapers and abstracted all of these entries of people looking for other people. And the entries were something like Owen McCarran looking for his brother Michael who was last heard of in Newfoundland, Canada. Uh, please contact him in Pawtucket, Rhode Island and gives us the telephone number or you know the address, that telephone number, the address at that time. The later ones may have had telephone numbers because they go up to like the 1900s. But they're 
available at New England HistGen um, on a database that if you're a member of the New England Historical Genealogical Society, they have them available there. But great news, New Jersey State Library has the first four volumes at the library. So when the library opens up, I would say go down and check that out. It's really worth the while. Um, but like I said, they're getting people from not only all over the United States, so there might be an ad in Boston for somebody in Philadelphia looking for a relative who's out in Missouri. I mean, it's that convoluted. It's kind of like, almost like the social media or the query boards that we're looking today, but in a printed form. So this girl did a fabulous job of doing this information and it's a great tool for us. And lots of times they'll tell you where in Ireland the family was from. So it might say Michael McCarran from County Monaghan, or it might say James Durden from County Louth. So, you know, you might find some great information, do it. So it's a great tool to look for. And it's also great for helping you narrow down the location of your surname. So if you've got a common surname like Riley or Murphy, you might be able to find a cluster of people, or you might be able to find even your own family members in there. So it's a great tool that I recommend to people all the time. So, Let's talk about jumping the pond. As I mentioned, the, the Irish researcher told me, Casey, you've got to find somebody who was born in Ireland after 1864. And so in this case, Irish civil registration. That's when they started registering people for birth and marriage and death. It starts in 1864. There's Catholic church records. Now, before 19... Uh, 2012, you couldn't get access to the Catholic Church records until you go to the library in Ireland. You had to get permission from the parish priest in some cases, and you had to look at microfilm. You weren't allowed to make a copy of the microfilm. Lo and behold, 2012, I believe it's 2012, they made them online at the National Library, digitized for free. So that's great. So it's another tool for us to look for. And there are some other records that we're going to talk about. So me, via me, had to do it the hard way. I took her advice. I looked at the 1864 marriages and births for Goodwins because Joseph and Beatrim, and they were all born in Ireland uh, between that time period. So I was kind of lucky to find the fact that I did have cousins that were born in Ireland at that time period. But when I went to look for Owen and Margaret, there was no Owen Campbell and Margaret Goodwood. I did find a Owen Campbell and a married to a Margaret McQuiggan, but I couldn't find anything else. And I was getting frustrated. Well, here are some three good books that you can look at to help you figure that out. If you don't have this book in your, in your library, you should. John Grenham's Tracing Your Irish Ancestors. The nice thing is John Grenham is, also has his own database, which I'll talk about in a few minutes. The Irish surnames of Ireland are also clues to give you hints as to where to look for the family names, the variations of the family names. And Irish pedigrees. This is in the New Jersey State Library, and this was the book that helped me figure out what I needed to do. It is online at thehathytrust.org and Google. There are newer versions of it. But the New Jersey State Library, I remember going down there, opening up, and I found this page, and I was like, ah! It says McCarran. So if I look at McCarran, it says McCarran, excuse me for my Irish. It's also listed as Karen, McCarran, 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 and Carson. Who would ever think that there are variations for a simple name as McCarran? But there you go. You have McKenna. Look at the variation of that. But if you go down to the bottom of the page, when I looked in the index and it said Goodwin, it was on the same page. I looked at the bottom, McGuigan, McGuigan. Goodwin and Godwin. Guess what? There's another variation called Ward too, which I didn't know. Pigeon, Quidgeon. I mean, it's all sorts of crazy names for McGuigan, but these are just some of the basic names. And I found it in that Bishop of Heart book. Now, had I did my homework and been thorough, be thorough, and looked at all of the city directories. Okay. I have to say at that time, I was going to New York City. New York City had the Pawtucket directories until 1880. I had to go home to direct, to look at the directories after 1880 and then 1903. Later on, I think the New Jersey State Library has it in their microfiche room. But if I looked just a little bit harder in the city directory in 1885, look here at the bottom. Goodwin C. McGuigan. Let me tell you, my ancestors are up in heaven right now having a good laugh because they made me do it the hard way. 
So there you go, Goodwin S. McGuigan. So I went back to Family Search. Here's Joseph Campbell. Here's Margaret and Owen living in Louth, County Louth, RD in Ireland. And when you look at a map, County Louth is right on the border of Northern Ireland. So it was technically in the 26 counties below Northern Ireland, but yet it's right on that border. So that's why those census records said Northern Ireland, and it makes sense now. Fortunately for me from this, I was able to go back and through the um, Mormon church, able to go and get a copy of all of Margaret's children, including Margaret and Owen's marriage record from, from um, Family History Center out in Salt Lake City. And it gave me this nice little information of Joseph, the road they were living on, New Road, his father, Owen, his mother, Margaret, and her signature, a little X. Isn't that great information? So good stuff from Family Search. Now, as for those Catholic baptismal records that came online, it was great because I started plugging in. Now, Ancestry has an index, and I find the index is a little bit hard, and you can see why by looking at these two examples, why Ancestry's index and in the images are kind of a little harder to do. And sometimes when you put in Ellen Goodwin or Ellen McGuigan, you're gonna come up with thousands of hits. But in this case, I have Ellen Goodwin McGuigan, the daughter of Patrick McGuigan and Ellen Conley. Okay, her her um, godparents are Peter McGough and Anne McGuigan, probably Patrick's sister. Whoops, let me go back here. Now, if we come over here, here's that was in Dundalk, telling me that the family didn't always stay in one town. We know that Ellen, um, we know that they were in Dundalk, but we also know that they were in county, um, they were in the little town of R.D. in County Louth. And if you look on a map. Dundalk is to the east of RD. So you can see that they probably moved back and forth between the two towns, wherever they could find the work or whatever the living conditions were. But here's Catherine, my Catherine, here is her baptismal. This was in 1847. So she was probably not 85 when she died, probably more like 94 when she passed. Her baptismal to her father, Pat, look at her mother, instead of Ellen, we have Helen. And look at the last name, instead of Conley, we have Conley. So you see right there between two records of two different sisters, two different towns, we've got some you know, information. So keep that in mind that you know, they may use different variations of their names. The great place to see the Catholic Church records is online at the National Library of Ireland.ie. So keep that in mind when you're looking for research. Now, if you can't, sad part about that uprising in 1922 is that some of the census records for Ireland were destroyed in that uprising. But a lot of people don't realize that a few years before that, some of the census records were destroyed, destroyed. they were pulped to make paper during World War I. So another reason why Irish records, the census records, you're not going to have them available for you. So what you do is you follow the money. In this case, we're going to follow tax records. And Griffith's valuation was, Griffith was a man who went throughout Ireland, him and his team went out through Ireland, and they went household to household to find out what type of living conditions the people were living in, how much the house was worth, who they were renting from, and how much tax could they, they, could they collect. So think about the money aspect that when you're looking for Irish relatives, follow the money. This case in the valuation of for County Louth, here we have right at the very top, Patrick McGuigan, whose landlord is James Gray. Whoops, he has a house and he's paying one, one pound five shillings for the, for the building. So it kind of gives us an idea that we know who he's renting from. There's another part of Griffith's valuation called the cancellation books, which talk about the people who left Ireland and they're crossed off in the book. Some of those are coming up online at Ask About Ireland. The nice thing about Ask About Ireland is you can look at these maps that were created for the Griffiths valuation and see what the town looked like in this time. So here we are, the bottom part of Artie. Here's John Street. That's where Owen and Margaret were living. Let me go back here. Notice there's a Roman Catholic church right there. This new road is now Drogheda Road. And over here is Hall. Hale Street. Now, unlike the United States where you have John Street and maybe John Street goes all the way across, 
the, when the road stops, a new road starts. So John Street, Hill Street. But even on Hill Street, you could have, in this case right here, the Roman Catholic par um, priest um, house, the, the um, I can't think of the word off the top of my head. But anyways, you have that there and that's called Moore Hall. It's not on Hill Street, it's just called Moore Hall. So when you write the address, Moore Hall, RD, Ireland. So keep that in mind when you're in Ireland that you could go like, you know, two feet and it could, the name could change. So really cool stuff. And they also have the divisions between parishes, counties, you have the civil registration districts, you have the parish districts, all of those play a role and you have to kind of know which district is which. The nice part is Ask About Ireland has a lot of that information for you on there to kind of help you along. So anyways, here's John Street, here's the Roman Catholic Chapel, the church. This is the church that Catherine was baptized in back in 1847. Pretty cool, huh? We went there, went to um, RD three times. First time it was empty, the second time it was a furniture store, and the third time when I went with my mom, it was empty again. So kind of like, you know, shows you that they didn't let that building go unused, they were using it for other things. So this is the front of John Street. This is looking down John Street. Here's the intersection right through here with New Road or Drogheda Road is. There's the Roman Catholic Church. And from the and from the Griffiths valuation, we learned that Patrick was living on the east side. So quite possibly this house here or down the street through one of these houses here. Quite possible that this could have been all of the homestead that were owned by um, the James Gray that was the owner of all those houses. So it kind of gives you a great idea as to what information, um, you know, what the buildings look like. So what are some other great Irish resources? Well, don't overlook the National Archives of Ireland. They have some school records that you can look at. The National Library of Ireland. My favorite uh, is johngrenham.com. He also has a page called Irish Ancestors. But John Grenham is so into Irish research. He's the guru of Irish research. Not only does he have that great book about tracing your Irish rec rec records, but he also has a website that will tell you the county and give you anything you want to know. Definitely worth your while this afternoon to take a look at his record, uh, look at his um, website. I mentioned askaboutireland.ie with the uh, valuation records. Another one, I think it's a subscription. I'm not sure how much it is, but I have seen it come, you know, come into its beating. Um, a few years ago, they had um, Irish dysphoria where they were asking for Irish people to come back to Ireland and to tell their Irish stories in other countries. So this is called Ireland Re Reaching Out, also known as Ireland Reaching Out. But again, you may find some information about Irish history or Irish relatives by looking at this site. A really cool site that you really should bookmark, and if you Google Irish Given Name Alternatives, you should come up with a website for Dennis A. Hogan. It's a PDF. And what this does, it gives you a great list of Irish first names and tells you the different um, names. For example, Bridget might be Biddy. Um, you might have Catherine as Kitty or Kate and so forth. But the one that blew my socks off and why I keep it bookmarked is my grandmother's name was Cecilia. And I can't figure out who in the family was named Cecilia. But I did find out that Ellen Conley her mother's name was Julia. So when I looked up Julia, it said also see Cecilia. Now it makes sense how Cecilia is a part of the name. So technically my grandmother was named after her great grandmother. Cool stuff. If you're on Facebook, do a search for Irish surnames or Irish, um, Irish counties. All of the, a lot of the counties, I'm pretty sure most of them or all of them do have a Facebook page that you could go on and look at. I know I'm on the Limerick, the County Louth and the Monaghan pages, and just great information, people sharing their DNA results and looking for information. I found some great records and books from Ireland that people are telling us about things here. Awesome stuff. Pinterest is great too for looking for Irish records. Gerard Cochran, who is an Irish genetic genealogist, he has this fabulous, fabulous site on Pinterest with all sorts of his Irish artifacts and history of Ireland from like all over the world. Great site to look at. Don't forget YouTube. You have Irish DNA. And as I mentioned, Gerard Corcoran, but also a whole group of professors from into genetic genealogy 
who can basically, and one thing that just knocked my socks off when I watched one of these shows was that they can basically take your Irish DNA and pretty much tell you where in Ireland your ancestors lived a thousand years ago. How cool is that? I just think that's awesome. So again, look at that, the Irish genetic genealogy, the, the videos, they're great information on there. When you do visit Ireland, I tell people to plan six to uh, six months, four to six months ahead of time. Keep checking the airlines for special rates. When my daughter and I went in 2009, I kept watching the airline rates. And at the time it was like, you know, $600 round trip. Well, they snuck in a quiet rate of $125 to fly from Philly to Ireland. Now, it was $125 for taxes, it was $300 round trip for me and my daughter to fly to Ireland in 2009. The trick was though, we had to fly from Philly to Chicago, then from Chicago to Ireland. As long as you have the time and you don't have a don't mind a layover, it might be worth the way to go to Ireland pretty and a pretty you know decent rate. Um, the three times I've been to Ireland have been off season, once in April and then twice in August, late August, early September. Why those times? Because a lot of people have stopped traveling for the summer. So it's a, it's still that things are still active and it's still about, but it's a little bit of a slower pace and you get to see a little bit more. I may have a great time doing it. Another trick I tell people to do is when you book your hotel room, so say you're going from the 16th to the 20th, book it for the 15th. Why would I want to book it for the 15th? Here's why. A lot of flights from the US to Ireland are overnight flights. So if you're leaving on Monday the 15th and arrive in Ireland on Tuesday the 16th, you're tired, you're flying overnight. So even though it's a five hour trip, you, you've lost a whole night of sleep. I had to do this with my mom because my mom was you know, getting up there in an age when I took her, but it worked out great because I called the hotel the day before to say, look, I'm flying in Tuesday morning, but I want my room for, to, for you know, Monday night, you know, keep that room for me, please. So that way, when I arrived at the hotel, I was able to book, go right into our room and take a nap before we went out and about. Makes a huge difference. So that's my suggestion or a tip for you about the hotel room the night before. Contact the local parish at least four to six weeks ahead of time. Um, because remember, parish priests have jobs. You know, there might be a funeral the day that you show up and say, hi, I'm here to look at records, you know. Not a good thing, you know, call ahead, plan ahead. Same thing with your local library, historical or genealogical societies in Ireland, contact them ahead of time. If you have time or before you go to those places, a must to to do is Dublin. They have the new Irish Family History Center right by the quay where the Irish famine um, immigrants are. This resource center was opened in 2016 and from what I heard, it is fabulous and helping people and doing their research and helping them point them into a direction of where to look for their research. So you might want to pop in there in Dublin if you're in Dublin and take that time. Get yourself a couple of rechargeable credit cards. Maybe use one for food and one for your genealogical research. That way your regular credit card isn't you know being used about this way if you lose like you know if you have it with $200 on it and you lose it it's a little bit easier to recoup $200 than it is to you know, get your whole credit card replaced. So that's kind of another tip that I use. Um, you might wanna contact a touring group like Paddy Wagon or C Ireland, C-I-E, I love that. Um, to see maybe to, to get a personal driver for the day, a little pricey, but you know what? It was worth the money. Um, I had a friend of mine who went to Ireland with his wife and unfortunately they were going through Connors Pass and if you've ever been down that way, it's only a one lane road to go over the pass and one of the tour buses was coming the other way and like a typical American, he had his arm hanging out the window and guess what? His arm got crushed and he ended up staying in Ireland a little bit longer than he wanted to uh, because of that. So, you know, if, you, if you're brave and you want to try driving in Ireland, go for it. But if you don't want to try driving, you know, contact one of these companies. They're really great people and wonderful to work with. And my last tip for about visiting Ireland is bring a bag of Hershey Kisses. Pack them in your suitcase, not in your carry-on because then you have to pay a value tax over there. But if you pack them in your suitcase and as you go to the library and before you leave, you hand them a bag of kisses and say, thank you for helping me. It really goes a long way. I did this in Dundalk and the librarian, I gave it to him when I arrived. I said, thank you for helping me and reaching out to me. Do you know that made such an impression that uh, uh, after I had returned from Ireland, 
he contacted me a couple months later and said, hey, I found a few more things. Are you interested? So, you know, it's always good to be a little bit nice to people over there because they're wonderful people over there, let me tell you. So what's happening in 2022? Well, I'm, as I mentioned, I talked about that horrible devastation of the, the, you know, the building being lost with all those great records in 1922. Well, Trinity College has decided, well, they had one of the archivists who was, you know, a curator of that of that building where all those records were kept, sat down after that blowing up that, that bombing and wrote a 300 page collection of all the collection that was blown up in that uprising. But guess what? Trinity College is now in the process of rebuilding this. And this is just so exciting. So if you click on beyond 2022, and you go to this site, come up to the gallery and check out the visual stories because here's the building. This is what it looks like, crazy. But they're rebuilding that building and they're gonna tell you what's on there. And if you just come down a little bit further, I love the picture right over here. Can you imagine? That's like <laughs> from 1390 and they still, they still have it. So they're gonna probably be definitely doing that over. But if you go down just a little bit further, you have these great videos that talk about the bombing. And this one right here is just a visual. It's just worthwhile to say. So, you know, keep that in mind when you, you know, if you want to look at that. But the, eventually their goal is to have that 300 page document that the curator write to look into other locations and they're starting to bring out. And they did a general survey and they found out that a lot of the records that they thought they lost in that bombing were held in other libraries. So, yes, our libraries are great. Uh, never give up, keep checking back on websites and databases online all the time, because after making me do it the hard way, if I had just followed through and been thorough, I would have found Thomas Campbell's naturalization in 1918 that tells me he was from County Love. I did try to track down all of Catherine's sisters, but I couldn't find Maria's, and once Family Search came online and they had the death records from Massachusetts, here she is, and even in her record, she has Patrick McGigan, and she was from County Love. So there were our records here in the United States I could have looked at if I had been a little bit more thorough and found the time to look for all these records. So keep that in mind. You've got to do those 10 and look at everything. So important. And like I say, keep checking back because last summer, one of the newspapers from Pawtucket was up online, and here I found this lovely tribute for Ellen Goodwin written by her son-in-law, Maria's husband, Ball. And it talks about how she was a strong woman, had a strong love for her native land, how she came to this country 26 years ago. Now this was in 1899 and was a native of Dundalk, south of Ireland. Now I'm a teacher and I happen to know that when you write the letter L in cursive, it can look like an S. So he probably wrote this letter in cursive, gave it to the, sent it to the newspaper and it, Someone had pointed out that maybe that S was transposed from an L. So it definitely helps point point where the family was from. So all in all, just remember, start with who you, what you know, expand to it, find as many relatives as you can, find their records, and chances are you should be able to find the route to get you over to Ireland that way. So remember, create your timeline, cite your sources. And Patrick, I think I did pretty well there. I think I'm ready for questions. All righty, thank you, Casey. Uh, we do have a few questions. Um, and yes, if anybody does have a question right now, uh, please submit it using the question feature on the dashboard. Um, you can send it in the chat feature of the dashboard or you can email me directly. So uh, the first question we have is from Susan and she asked, I have an ancestor who says that he was born in Galway. Would an Irish immigrant generally give his town as where he was from, or could he have given his county or townland, et cetera? Yes, 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 yes. Um, it could be both. It could be that, you know, he. it was easier for them to say they were from County Galway instead of they're saying they're from, uh, well, I'm from Ardy, which is near Dundalk, which is north of Dublin, you know, so they probably say, oh, I'm from County Louth, you know, so it was, yes, it would be definitely, they definitely would have said Galway, but at least it gives her a starting point of looking for where in Ireland to look for them. So yes, definitely, you know, they would do both. All right. Uh, the next question is related to the uh, the three books that you had on um, 
Irish last names. Um, Deb wanted to know what the second in that list was because she didn't get a chance to grab it. Yep, no problem. That one was um, Edric McSlice's um, Irish surnames. It's, I, I always say McSlice well, cor incorrectly is probably said another way, but it's um, M M A C L Y S A G H T. And if she does a Google search for Irish surname, she should be able to come across that. And I believe that is available on an on Amazon, so she may be able to pick it up there, either you new or used. So. All right. Uh, let's see. Uh, Steve has a question. Any suggestions for Brooklyn, New York, uh, such as civil oh. and Roman Catholic? Yes. Well, the nice thing is Find My Pass has a lot of the New York City. Um, they're working on the um, Catholic records. But there's a book by um, a, two, a book by two women out of New York, and their names elude me right now. But they have a kind of a similar tracing uh, missing friends series that's out of that area that could help you. I would also check the Brooklyn News that's online, the Brooklyn Eagle. That's available online if you do a Google search for the archives for the Brooklyn Eagle. You can look at that online for free. There may be some information in there that might help them out. Um, definitely contact the um, parish directory up in New York City because they could also give you some information. They may have like some information about the baptismal record, which may lead you to more relatives or people who knew your family, which could put you back to a location in Ireland as well. All right. Um, Karen asked that she's new to genealogy and wanted to know what is Family Search. Family Search is the Mormon site. Um, what they've done is they have, their library is phenomenal out in Salt Lake City. Um, they have over five rolls of mic, five million rolls of microfilm for the United States alone, and at least close to two million for Ireland and England and Scotland. Um, but what they've been doing is they've been digitizing those rolls of microfilm and making them available online. So you may be able to find some Irish records using familysearch.org. It's a free site, but you do have to register. Um, definitely worth your while to check that site out because they have a lot of great gems in there. So I would tell her to check that out for certain. All right. Uh, Eileen asks, can, could we see individual list of events again? I, th I, see the, I think I can, I could do that. The list of individual events, like the timeline. Uh, I don't know. I'm trying to get out of my screen, but it's locked. Uh, let me see if I can go over here and see if it'll let me do it. Hang on a second. List of, nope, it's, it's, for some reason I'm locked here. Nope, I'm locked. So I can't do it. But basically when I do the list of events, I just list like, I do a timeline. I keep it very simple. I start with the birth and I go to the death and I just fill it in as time goes on. And the nice part about doing it on the computer is you can always add another row of information. Like, you know, you can add a line in there, whether you do it on Excel or in a Microsoft Word document. It's just great to keep adding on to it. And I keep it with my genealogical paper so that if I'm at the library, I could take that out and look at, okay, what do I need to get at the library? And it helps me keep me on track that way. All right, and yeah, as a reminder, uh, we are recording this webinar, so um, hopefully later today, if not tomorrow, um, this it'll be uploaded to our YouTube channel, and then um, I will send everybody who's registered for this a link to it. So, awesome. Um, a question from Richard asks: Is it possible to find records for ancestors born in Ireland prior to 1830, the year that the Catholic Church started to keep records in Ireland? Yes and no, it depends. Um, it's, you know, if you're lucky, if you can find more records here in the United States to put you back in Ireland back a little bit, uh, because some of those records were destroyed in that palming and, and, and um, you know, back in 1922. You can find maybe um, a list of, like they have wills that are available. There's like a whole list of other things, but it involves further research and deeper research. Um, both here in the United States as well as Ireland. I would suggest that if they contact that Irish History Center over in Dublin, I do their website, you may be, he may be able to get some information from them that could point you, point him in a direction of where to look for in Ireland. So that's what I would suggest that he that he try that. All right. 
Uh, Teresa says, um, wanted to know if she'll make your slides available, but as I said, the, the webinar will be recorded and uploaded, so you'll be able to get anything you missed um, from right. the recording. So. Let me see. I think if they look at their handout, if they have a question later on down the road that they want to ask me, they could always, you know, send me an email. I believe my email address is at the top of my handout. So, and I will be around New Jersey. I'm all over the place. So once you know this quarantine is lifted, I'll be, <laughs> I'll be around New Jersey speaking. So, all right. uh, Richard said thank you so much for answering. That. Okay. Tell him he's welcome. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Let's see if anybody else has any questions. Nancy has a comment that says, amazing that your relatives left, left such a paper trail. Uh, tell them they made me work for it. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it took me over 30 years to figure out where in Ireland they were from, but when I did find it, it was doing the happy dance. So yeah, it took, it took a long time, but you know, like I say, just being thorough and just checking all of the records is really key. I mean, you know, I had records here in the United States that I was missing, you know, newspaper articles I didn't know about, and, but you know, I did it the hard way, but yeah, it does, you know, help when you do find things that way. I remember doing research down in Maryland for a lady from um, right here in New Jersey and her family came into Maryland, Baltimore and they had um, naturalization records back in the 1850s. Unfortunately, all those records said Ireland, but how I was able to put her family together was to look at the newspaper articles of similar surnames that died. And fortunately for me in the Baltimore papers, it said so-and-so from County Galway, so-and-so from County Meath. So I was able to pinpoint at least two counties for her to look at. So that's another trick that I've done too that helps. Great. Um, Jean wants to know about how to, if you have any information about Protestant relatives in Ireland. Yes, that's another bowl of wax. Um, Basically, the Church of England records are available for you to research, but unfortunately, some of those don't start um, at the same time as the Catholic records. Um, a place to look for some of those Church of England records would be Northern Ireland, Ireland at the um, Public Records Office in Northern Ireland up in Belfast. That's one place that I would direct people to look for those records, as well as Dublin. Um, but yeah, Protestant church records are available. And the thing that a lot of people don't realize that they could have started off Catholic, but they went to Protestant because they wouldn't get into trouble that way. Um, so, you know, with, you know, Catholics were, you know, frowned upon for a long time. So even some of your Irish Catholic relatives may have been Protestant. Um, there is, like I say, a whole nother genre of Irish research just for the Protestant church records. If you look online at do Irish genealogy on YouTube, you may be able to find a couple of locations there. But again, I would contact Peroni up in Belfast, P-R-O-N-I, the Public Records Office of Northern Ireland. Also to um, ch check with the Irish um, Research Center in Dublin. There would be another direction that they could help you point you in the direction of more, more Protestant church records and so forth. All right, um, let's see, Nancy asked, are you available via email to suggest some alternative ways of research if paper trails are not available? Um, let's see, alternative ways. <laughs> yeah, she could send me an email. I could take a look at what she has and you know, maybe you know, give us a couple ideas. So yes, I would definitely do that for her. All right, she said, thank you. And she's welcome. <laughs> All right, any other questions? All right, I think. Um, uh, Steve. 
says that he would like to receive notices about where you'll be speaking in New Jersey and uh, that PS during this session that he noticed his grandfather Skelly was misindexed as Shelley. Yes. Yep. The good stuff, isn't it? <laughs> Lots of stuff like that happens. Um, right now, um, I'm scheduled to go to Avalon once Avalon Library opens back up in June, July through the uh, through November. I'm also supposed to be speaking in beginning of June. That's iffy right now. It depends on what happens with the libraries, whether when they open or not. Um, the first Wednesday in June, I'm supposed to be speaking for the Ocean County Genealogical Society. So a lot of things were rescheduled. I know I'm going to be up in Morris County probably either in the fall or in the spring. I'm going to be back at Hudson County. Um, right now it looks like January of next year. So those are some of the places. Uh, if he sends me an email, you know, asking me, I could probably, or it goes to the Avalon Public Library, you can look there. I tr truly am all over the state. So, you know, I could be in North Jersey one day and South Jersey the next. So. You know, I would suggest check the Avalon Public Library or, you know, Ocean County and some of the genealogical societies through New Jersey to have me listed. Uh, Susan wants to know where in Morris County. Um, right now I'm scheduled for MAGS for, I believe, September. So I just spoke up there right before the quarantine um, at the um, Washington Township Library um, right there outside of Califont. So, um, but I'll be, we'll, We'll be talking to Mags later on in the year, I believe. That's still, you know, being worked out. Depends on what happens with when we get this quarantine lifted. So, uh, Kathleen wants to know where you would look for passenger records. Good question. Ancestry has a lot of the passenger records online, so I would start with Ancestry. Um, don't overlook like if your family can't lived in Rhode Island, in Massachusetts, but don't overlook New York because they're, they took the cheapest way from Ireland into the United States. And I probably should have mentioned this in the in the talk that sometimes they might have gone through Canada and come down. They may have go through New Orleans and come over. They may have gone to um, you know Baltimore and come up. So you no, know, the trains were available. They went to where the cheapest route were. A lot of people assume that the family left you know County Cork. But don't overlook Liverpool because a lot of the passenger records, as I showed in my film, left from Liverpool to go to Massachusetts. So, you know, they, it could be a variety of different ways that they came over. So I definitely start with the ancestry and then from there, check the National Archives in Washington, D.C. or the different branches to see what they have. Uh, Deb wants to know where you find naturalization records. Same thing, National Archives and Ancestry. When I was looking for um, my, um, you know, the, the cousins that would have been naturalized, I found three of them in Pawtucket, Rhode Island at the um, state um, Supreme Court records. Um, the brother showed up in the US records because it was after 1903 where everything became a little bit more standardized. So keep that in mind when you're looking for naturalizations, it could be at the local level, the county level, as well as the national level. So check all three places. But I would start with the National Archives. Um, either check Ancestry has a lot of them digitized, so does Family Search. Um, also check, um, like I say, the individual archives or offices. So like for New Jersey, you would look in New York City, for New York and New Jersey. For New England, it's up in Waltham, Massachusetts. For Pennsylvania, Delaware, Virginia, West Virginia, believe it or not, you would look in Philadelphia. So, you know, in Maryland. So those, you know, all of those are central, you know, central, centrally located. So those are the places that you would look. If you can't find it there, always check the National Archives out of Washington, D.C., the main office, and they could, you know, send you to the direction where you need to go as well. All right. Joe asks, how do you reconcile conflicting dates among resources? Do you use the oldest source? Um, I would put both sources in, both the conflicting dates, and note it that this, date, like for example, for Catherine's birth record, um, we have some dates said 1854, some said 1855. She was pretty consistent of saying November of 1854 for her birthday, even though her birth date was, her baptismal was in 1847. 
So I know all of that and I write down the sources and I, at least if I have it noted so that when future generations, they go back and look for that information, they can see the three sources, you know, and say, okay, Aunt Kathy had this, these three sources down and, and that, that's what we're going to go by. So, you know, I would say note it all, you know, just to be on the safe side, cover your tracks. It's better to have them all there as opposed to, you know, not having one and just saying that the other was wrong. Like Eileen asked, did Irish children have nationalization records or just parents? Just the parents. Now, that's this is another ball of wax I could talk for hours on. Um, in the time period from about 1860 to about 1920, women were not naturalized unless they were married to their husband. It's really kind of an interesting story. The men were naturalized. If the oldest son was over a certain age, he may have been naturalized. But if he's under, like, say, 18, he may be naturalized with his parents, with his father was naturalized. Usually it was the father that was naturalized. Women were secondary um, citizens, unfortunately to say that, but they were. You could be a woman who lived in New England all her life, her, for generations. You marry the Irishman down the street, you became Irish, and you were naturalized when you married him. So, you know, it, or when he became naturalized. So, you know, it's a whole ball of wax. It wasn't until women's rights 100 years ago, 1920, that um, women, you know, started, you know, getting recognized to having their naturalization separate from their husband. So if you have a relative, doesn't matter what nationality, my husband's grandparents, great grandparents, he was from Switzerland, she was from Poland. She was naturalized when he got naturalized in 1908 as opposed to, you know, as getting her own naturalization. And unfortunately, sometimes with women, women, you can't find that other bit of information. So, you know, it's something, it's a whole different ball of wax and it's really an interesting, you know, time of our American history. But, you know, usually it's with the father, unless the ch child was over a certain age, then maybe the child would have been naturalized with the parents, so. Uh, Sean wanted to say thank you for your time. It was a great presentation. Oh, thank you. I love this stuff. <laughs> <laughs> All righty. Well, I think that's it. So again, thank you everybody for attending and thank you, Casey. It was very, thank very you. good. Thank you, Andrew. And, you know, guys, take care of yourself. Stay healthy. All right. All right. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.